work. To feed one, she worked from home. Took in washing, ironing, sewing. One small mouth, a soup-filled spoon. Life was a dream. To feed two, she worked outside, sowed seeds, watered, threshed, scythed, gathered barley, wheat, corn. Twins were born to feed four. She grafted harder. Second job in the alehouse, food in the ladder, food on the table. She was game, able. Feeding ten was a different kettle. Was factory gates at first light, oil, metal, noise, machines. To feed fifty, she toiled, sweated, went on the night shift, slept, lifted. For a thousand more, she built streets for double that high rise flats. Cities grew, her brood doubled, people, skyscrapers trebled. To feed more, more. She dug underground, tunneled, laid down track, drove trains, quadruple came, multiplied. She built planes, out for sound, mother to millions now. She flogged TVs, designed PCs, ripped CDs, burned DVDs. There was no stopping her. She slogged day and night at internet shopping. A billion named, she trawled the seas, hoovered fish, fell trees, gay, grazed beef, sold cheap fast food, put in a 90 hour week. Her offspring swelled, she fed the wild, wept rain, scattered the teeth in her head for grain, swam her tongue in the river to spawn, sick and died, lay in a grave, worked to the bone, her fingers 24 seven. Okay, so it's quite unusual for me to start by reading it, but I think this is one that you do gain quite a bit from reading it because of the fast pace and you really feel that accumulation, which you don't necessarily have in some of the others. Um, so, so looking at work, so work is one of the poems which I like to call exponential. Um, as I said before, I don't think that's a literary term, but it makes sense to me because what you've got is her going from feeding one, two, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and it grows exponentially. And um, the other thing which grows in this poem is it's almost like a whistle stop tour through history. So you've got stanza one, which is the ideal domestic life. You've got stanza two. And moving on from domestics to farming. So then you move on again. And this third stanza um, begins to remind, reflect the Renaissance. By the fourth stanza, you're entering the industrial period. <coughs> the fifth stanza is a particular focus on urbanization what this and then you've got the sixth stanza which focuses on transport so both of those are still in the industrial era and you've got floor, fifth sorry uh, seventh stanza which is modern um, postmodern. Then you've got the eighth stanza, which actually focuses on the exploitation of nature. Again, modern postmodern. And the final stanza, which again we've sort of stopped moving through time to some extent but it could be future or it could be a continuation of exploitation i don't know i'll go back at when i'm looking at each of the stanzas i'll explore those ideas further but they're how i would sort of classify them <coughs> sorry okay so if we go through 
one of the most important things in this poem is the growth of her children. So going from one um, to millions, um, perhaps even billions. And that's representative as well as the themes of moving through time, because especially in the past 200 years, the world population has swelled enormously. So, to feed one, sets up our refrain, um, which appears four times in the poem, to feed one, to feed two, to feed four, to feed more. And it identifies the main reason that people work um, to, or at least the main reason that people used to work, which was to feed their families. Now some would argue that people work in order to improve themselves. To feed one, um, you've got an immediate introduction to maternity. And maternity is a key concept in this poem, which is interesting from a feminist perspective because you've got the combination of work and maternity, which have often been incompatible. It's only really in the last 50 years or so that becoming pregnant has not meant that you automatically lose your job. Um, so to feed one, she works from home and you've got the fact that it's unusual to have a woman as a breadwinner. Winner. Um, not so much now, um, potentially still relatively unusual back in 2002, but certainly if we look in history, um, though there were a lot of women who did work, very few would have been considered the breadwinner for their family. Um, it's also highlighting the potential for single parents, um, which is a far more common issue today than it was even 50 years ago. But the fact that she's the one working, it gives her the power, and that's really typical of both this collection of Duffy's and Duffy as a whole because she likes putting women in the roles which traditionally belong to men, such as breadwinner. But at the moment she is shaking, washing, ironing, sewing. So these are all feminine, you know, they are feminine, domestic, activities. So these are the sort of activities that actually when we've had right-wing backlashes, um, so under Hitler in Germany, uh, under the Soviet Union, and in America and Britain, when you have the support for women uh, in their role in the home, these are the sort of activities that they would be doing. So again, she's mixing the feminine, the domestic, and work. So one small soup mouth, a soup filled spoon. So you've got the sibilance of soup and spoon. And it also suggests that her child is very young, perhaps not able to eat solids yet, um, which builds on her image of maternity. Got a very interesting idea that life was a dream. And that says, is, is, is the cliche potentially picking up on the pastoral tradition? Oh, 
Sorry about that. And is is Duffy promoting or challenging this idea of female domesticity? and um, its relation to work. So it's, I think it's, it's quite a complex line, although, it's, although it is a cliche line, life was a dream, because, because of the conflicting themes you've got in this one stanza. <laughs> so to feed two, oh, sorry, the, let me just adjust the layout of this poem. Because this is one of those poems where Duffy has run on stanzas. Um, so, yeah, to feed two, she worked outside, sowed seeds, watered thrush, skies, gathered barley, wheat, and corn. A synthetic listing. Typical Duffy. Um, repeated structure, you've got the parallelism between to feed one, to feed two. Quite frankly, you've got. Um, a lexus of farming, as we've already pointed out, this is an idea of the farming era in history. There's also focus on food, barley, wheat and corn. Um, and it's the introduction of more manual labour. So... The labour in the first stanza is quite feminine. The labour in the second stanza is becoming more masculine. It's harder. The list is longer, suggesting that the work is harder. And the question is also whether she's doing this in addition to um, her washing, ironing and sewing, or instead of. And um, it's also a sign of her low class. In history, people who worked outside were the lowest classes, and that's why a tan used to be unfashionable because it meant that you were poor and had to work outside. But all of these activities, especially ideas of sowing seeds and water and gathering, less so threshing and sky, are activities that would have been done by uh, farmers' wives. So, though it's hard work, although it's more masculine, it's still somewhat pastoral um, and then we've got the arrival of two more children very quickly so it's a mark of how quickly the people are going well her family are growing again parallelism so this is where we've got run on stanza to feed four, she grafted harder. Uh, connection, poem, or connection of the stanzas showing that they're not separate, that it's all one. She's grafting harder, she's got a second job in the ale house. Um, so that's quite unfeminine. Um, and that's moving away from being self-employed to actually being employed, which is also uh, different because traditionally, if women were engaged in work, it would be um, that it would be self-employed, so either thing or working with their husband. So, uh, we've got tip Duffy's typical use of demotic, colloquial, uh, the vernacular language, which just shows that she is an everyday person. Um, was a different kettle is quite an interesting one because it's actually, it's a cliche or an idiom, but it's a cliche that's been cut short because the idea would normally be a different kettle of fish, meaning something completely different. And the fact that the second half has been missed off, that we've just got was a different kettle, marks out that she's in a hurry, that she has no time. And 
we're starting to get a potential criticism of capitalism. And this is a criticism of capitalism, which is seen in some of other some of Duffy's other poems in the collection, probably most notably The Woman Who Shopped, which is the poem which directly precedes work in the collection. So run on stanza again and actually by starting part way through the line it shows disorder, shows the need for rapidity. And we've got the introduction of adenation. Um, hyperbole, extended metaphor, whichever you prefer to use. Showing that what she's doing is now becoming impossible. So the idea of factory gates at first light, oil, metal, noise, machines. So we've got this continuation of asymptotic listing, which marks how hard it is. In addition, to that, it's a typical image of the industrial period. So you've got industrialization, uh, typically spanning from around 1780 to 1900. Um, it's a typical timing of the industrial revolution. And you had this move from the cottage industry, uh, where in the cottage industry people did piecework, working at home in their cottages. Um, a few people gathered together to factories where everybody is working under uh, strict regulations. So these are just some historians' interpretations on what factories were like. If you want to read them, I would encourage you to pause the video and look over them. So. Back to the poem. Got this continued. Oh, sorry, I said earlier that there were only four occurrences. You want to feed fifty. So to feed fifty, it's again the parallelism. Traditionally, factory work was taken by men, but many women were employed in factories because women could be paid half as much as a man, um, which was quite attractive to employers. So a lot of women would have been employed and yeah, she toiled, sweated, went on the night shift. These are all ideas which would have been quite typical of the Victorian era. Um, in case you're wondering, Schlepp is um, American and, an inf and inf is American informal. Um, which has very similar meaning to the rest of them. So Duffy's using accumulation in her asyndetic listing. So, for a thousand more. So this is relating to the continued growing population, which happened uh, yeah, the population did grow significantly during the industrialization period. She built streets. And focus on transport was a big part in industrialization. If we hadn't improved the transport mechanisms we had, then we would never have got to this new society. So you started off by building streets, just double that. And the concept of high-rise flat cities grew, had really doubled people to sky screen. That, they're themes that have continued. Um, skyscrapers weren't built during the Victorian period, really. <laughs> they're much more modern uh, because of growth in architecture. And these ideas are still very relevant today. So I think Duffy's highlighting um, how effectively we're running the community, uh, the pastoral, possibly, um, looking at ideas of eco-feminism. Then she dug underground. Um, there's a possibility of trains which are invading nature. Just an interesting textual point. 
this can be dated potentially to 1863, which is when the Metropolitan line opened on the underground. I can spell, I'm just not very good at typing, I apologise. <laughs> so she laid down tracks and she's engineering and engineering was almost exclusively a uh, male profession. So as the poem continues, it's a way she is defying more and more stereotypes. Multiplied. Um, she built planes, outstrip, outflew sound, uh, suggests that she's outstripping nature and she's mothered millions now. So she's moved from being a mother of one, she's now reminiscent more of Mother Earth or Mother Nature, potentially. I love these two lines, personally. Um, I think that really common abbreviations, stuff we use every day, postmodern, technological, creates a really fast pace, uh, potential criticism of the modern world. There's kind of para rhyme in TVs, PCs, CDs, DVDs. And it's just so typical of our modern lifestyle. The other thing Thing that I had noticed is although ripped and burned are the correct terms to use for season, they're really negative. The connotations of them are so negative, it's suggesting potentially an implicit uh, criticism of modern lifestyle. Uh, likewise, flogged. Look there, she could have been sold. And flogged, ripped, burned, very, very negative with their, well, different meanings. Obviously, flogged could just relate to physical punishment, ripped, um, it's quite a violent action, burning is very painful. <laughs> And there was no sort but also she slogged day and night at internet shopping or sorry night and day and is that pleasure rather than work or is she is her work shopping um intrinsic link there back to the woman who shopped as well so a billion named moving relatively modern obviously today our population is i think i think it's about seven is it seven billion um that sort of figure but it first reached a billion uh around about 1800 to 1810 is when it's thought to have reached a billion which is obviously a nearly by at least 150 years before the ideas which we're looking at and got this answer so trawled the seas hoovered fish felled trees grazed beef that that's just sickening grazed beef because it's objectifying cows to no more than a piece of meat sold cheap fast food suggesting that fast food is yeah made from cows whose life is not worth living and to a modern audience yeah i read it now probably similarly the idea of animal rights brought up uh, you've also got ideas of the environment, so deforestation, the developing world and the exploitation of workers in the developing world, the 
terrific pollution. <laughs> Sorry. Of the oceans. And then, and I think what those what this answer does is brings it into modern day, especially as she was writing in this in two thousand and two, and all the themes are completely relevant today. That I think is in itself is a message to the reader saying things things need to change, but they haven't. Um, things are starting to change. Uh, documentaries like Blue Planet are helping us recognise this. Very, very slow process. And you've got the 90, the 90 hour a week. And I mean, a 90 hour a week, uh, that, that a lot of people will have worked a 90 hour a week, not common. Now it's more than double what a full time job would be considered. It's working 30, nearly 13 hours a day, seven days a week. And you've just got this simple reminder that she fed that this is actually focused on food and keeping the wild alive. So she fed the wild, wept rain. And this one, she's almost become godlike. Um, she is weeping the rain. Sorry, that was a poorly constructed sentence. Scattered the teeth in her head. She's now physically involved, so she's weeping rain. And the head for grain. And swam her tongue in the river to spawn sickened the ideas of ecological poisoning. They're in a grave, and she's still working while she's in a grave. Or is it that she's worked to the bone? And that's killed her. There's no rest. And the suggestion that the life we have today is unsustainable. <laughs> okay, so this is just a really short summary of... Well, it's not proper analysis because there are no quotes. It's a really short summary of how I see the poem work. Um, this is likely to be my last video on feminine gospels. If you want me to go over any of the poems in a different way, um, or if there are any other poems which you're particularly interested in, please comment and I will consider them. Um, I will probably be uploading at some point uh, some comparative videos, but this will be should be the last poem focused video.